All right, we're let's begin. We're streaming live on Facebook now. Uh, hello, good evening. I'm Ann Luther with the League of Women Voters of Maine. Um, welcome on behalf of the League and our co-sponsors at the Ellsworth American, the Mount Desert Islander, the Weekly Packet, the Casting Patriot, and Island Advantages. These great papers have joined the League in sponsoring this series of events. The League has been promoting voter participation for over 100 years. If you are interested in joining the League, we would welcome you as a member or volunteer. Our website is lwvme.org. For our event tonight, participants on Zoom will be muted throughout and the chat will be turned off. Participants on Zoom can submit questions through the Q&A box. You'll see that on the bottom of the toolbar on your Zoom screen. Fair warning, we have received quite a few questions in advance by email, but I hope we'll have time for four or five audience questions. So feel free to put something into the Q&A box and our moderator will work them into the uh, rotation if possible. We will not be monitoring questions on Facebook. We do have somebody monitoring the Facebook comments, but only to make sure that we keep the conversation civil mm -hmm. over there. If you're on Facebook and want to ask a question, it's not too late to join the Zoom. Go to lwvme.org slash events and register now to get the participant link. Once you've clicked that link, you'll be immediately admitted to the Zoom webinar and you can pose your question there. The Facebook video will be available for later viewing on Facebook and through our online voter guide at vote411.org. The League of Women Voters of Maine posts these recordings of forums in order to inform voters. The recordings are unedited. Viewers may share or embed the complete video. However, no parties are authorized to download, edit, or distribute any part of this recording without written co consent from the League of Women Voters of Maine. Excerpts and or edited clips of recordings may not be used for partisan, political, and or campaign purposes. We appreciate your cooperation in this. Now, let me introduce our moderator for tonight, Cindy Wood. Cindy is managing editor of the Ellsworth American, an Ellsworth native. She joined the staff of the American in 2007 as a reporter, and now here she is, the boss. Um, here's Cindy. I'll see you back here at the end. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing this forum here tonight, and thank you candidates for attending. Jump right into the bios this evening. Um, incumbent Matthew Foster grew up in Ellsworth and graduated from Ellsworth High School. He and his wife, Melissa, live in Hancock with their 10-year-old daughter, Ashlyn. Matt graduated from the University of Maine at Orono with a degree in psychology. He later attended Suffolk University and Suffolk University Law School, earning a master in business administration and a Juris Doctor. He practiced law from 2003 to 2014 with his father and uncle and later owned his own and later in his own firm. He served on the Ellsworth Zoning Board of Appeals and the Ellsworth City Council. He was elected district attorney in 2014 and reelected in 2018. He is a Mason and a Shriner. He and his daughter enjoy dirt bike riding, swimming, and practicing martial arts. Robert Granger grew up in Blue Hill, graduated from George Stevens Academy, and lives in town with his wife of 27 years, Megan. Their son, Curran, attends the University of Maine at Orono, where Bob graduated in journalism. Bob later attended and graduated cum laude from the Vermont Law School. He has 31 years of trial experience in all state and federal courts. He served as Justice of the Peace for 27 years and has worked with Maine State Troopers and the Maine Association of Police since 2012. He served as law clerk for the 10th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals and as a graduate of the Vermont Police Academy. He is a former airline pilot and woodland firefighter. The ground rules for tonight's discussion are simple. Audience members are invited to submit questions through the Q&A function, as Anne mentioned, and we received several in advance via email. Each candidate will have three minutes to make an opening statement. Both candidates will be asked to respond to three questions that were provided to them in advance. The order of questioning will alternate between the candidates. For each question, the response will be limited to three minutes. Candidates will then be presented with questions posed by the audience. Questions will be selected by the moderator and may be reworded. A question may be posed to a single candidate, but the other candidate will be given an opportunity to respond. Responses will be limited to two minutes. We anticipate that there will be time for at least four questions from the audience. 
Finally, each candidate will be given two minutes to present a closing statement. So we will jump right into opening statements. Um, Matt, you wanna start us off? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, as uh, was noted before, my name is Matt Foster. I've been the district attorney for uh, nearly eight years. I live in Hancock with my wife, Melissa, and our 10-year-old daughter, Ashlyn. I grew up in Ellsworth and graduated from Ellsworth High School, and I've lived in Downey's Maine most of my life. Uh, I'm a veteran of the United States Army, where I served as an enlisted airborne combat paramedic in the 82nd Airborne Division. I'm passionate about serving my country, my state, and the people here in Downey's Maine. During my career in private practice, the majority of my work involved representing low-income criminal and family matter clients. I received recognition uh, from the Maine State Bar Association in 2009 for having provided the most pro bono hours of any attorney in Hancock County that year. And I received recognition from the Maine Supreme Court, the Katahdin Council Recognition Program, for providing the people of Hancock County with 50 plus hours of free legal services in that year. Over the past eight years as district attorney, I've put together a team of dedicated prosecutors to serve the people of Hancock and Washington counties. I've worked tirelessly alongside them to provide the very best service to the people who elected me. Uh, a lot of people may not know what a district attorney does. A district attorney um, manages a staff of assistant district attorneys who prosecute criminal cases. Uh, we're responsible for handling everything from traffic violations up to attempted murder. Uh, certain crimes are only handled by the attorney general's office uh, like murder and uh, certain other crimes. But for the most part, uh, this office handles all of the crimes and criminal prosecutions that occur in, in District 7. Um, I'd appreciate the opportunity to continue to put my talents to the services of the people of District 7, uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing on as District Attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, your opening statement? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for uh, having this program and for you, Cindy, uh, moderating it. I'm the independent candidate for District Attorney because I feel that politics have no place in the DA's office or anywhere near charging decisions or sentencing recommendations. Uh, as a district attorney, the, the only allegiance is to the office and to all of the citizens, not a particular party. I wanna use this time primarily just to uh, introduce myself. Um, I encourage you to visit my campaign website, my campaign Facebook page uh, to learn more about me as I can only uh, scratch the surface here. I've been an attorney 31 years, the last 25 at Acadia Law Group and Roy Beardsley Williams and Granger, its predecessor. My primary focus has been uh, criminal law and civil litigation. I've tried hundreds of cases and dozens of jury trials across Maine. I've admitted to practice in Maine, uh, the U.S. District Court and the United States Court of Appeals for the first and 10 circuits. In 1996, I was appointed by the chief judge to serve as justice of the peace and commission with authority to issue search warrants, arrest warrants, uh, involuntary committals and other uh, criminal process. And I've retained that commission uh, for the last 26 years. I was recruited in 2013 uh, as critical incident response attorney for the Maine State Troopers. And shortly thereafter, I was recruited by virtually every law enforcement group in Maine to serve that role. I respond to police use of deadly force incidents anywhere in state and represent officers during the investigations that are conducted by the Attorney General's office. I served 10 years as a Federal Criminal Justice Act panel attorney in the U.S. District Court, where I handled cases ranging from bank robbery to firearms crimes, to drug trafficking conspiracies and immigration offenses. In state court, I've handled everything from manslaughter to gross sexual assaults, domestic violence, and a whole slew of other state offenses. I was a law clerk in the U.S. Court of Appeals where I drafted written decisions for three judge appellate panels uh, in federal criminal cases, including death penalty cases. I'm a former state law enforcement officer. I graduated from Vermont uh, Criminal Justice Academy's 44th basic class. And I also worked as a wildland uh, firefighter for the US Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest. I'm a former airline captain and certified flight instructor in both single and multi-engine aircraft. And I have over 7,200 hours of uh, accident-free flying. I've been endorsed for district attorney for District 7 by the Fraternal Order of Police, which includes the Washington County Sheriff's Deputies and the Machias Police Patrol. I've also been endorsed by the former commander of the Maine Drug Enforcement Agency and former Aroostook County Sheriff. I grew up in Blue Hill and I've lived there for 27, well, since coming back to Maine since 92. 
and I've lived there with my wife of 27 years, uh, Megan, uh, who works as a, a counselor in the Blue Hook Consolidated School. We have one son, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving into our first question of the three that were provided in advance. Uh, what are the biggest issues facing the DA's office? Uh, Bob, do you wanna start this one off? Sure, uh, I think the obvious one uh, is alleviating the uh, criminal case backlog of uh, nearly 1,400 cases at last count that are pending in both uh, Hancock and Washington counties. Um, that backlog developed for a number of reasons. Um, of course, the uh, court shutdown during the COVID pandemic played a role. But I think another issue that raised a uh, problem is the overcharging of defendants by the current office which has resulted in significantly longer uh, case resolution times. And more charges you add on to a defendant's complaint, the longer it's take, gonna take to try those cases. I'd like to uh, end the shotgun approach to charging decisions and focus more on major crimes and stop indicting defendants unless there's a real intent to take those cases to trial. We're seeing a lot of indictments that are pled down to uh, misdemeanors uh, after a grand jury found probable cause to pursue those matters. We're seeing a lot of dismissals. Um, I can go through a whole bunch of cases that uh, on point, but I think that the, the public has seen uh, every, every week in the Ellsworth American what's happening with the cases. Um, second is uh, issue is regaining the trust of the Washington County uh, citizens, because I think they've uh, largely felt shortchanged by the current administration. Um, for a long time, they've only had one assistant prosecutor uh, serving uh, in Machias uh, to handle both Machias and Callis. Um, I'd like to regain the trust of sexual assault advocates who work with rape victims. Um, one sexual assault advocate re recently uh, disclosed to me that out of 24 assault referrals to the current administration, they only took four cases. And the reason that was given was it's only a she said, he said case. That's what rape is. Um, if the sexual assault victims have courage to come forward, the DAs ought to have courage to support these victims through grand jury and trial. They're, these aren't crimes that take place in public in a crowded room. They're crimes of opportunity and vulnerable victims. We also need to regain the trust of law enforcement officers who feel that their hard work has largely been ignored the last eight years. We've seen, had officers with decades of experience resigning or taking retirement out of frustration. The officers are frustrated. We also need to face the reality that a lot of the uh, uh, newer officers with uh, less than three years of duty time have never seen the inside of a courtroom uh, due to the COVID shutdown and uh, other issues. Those officers need to have some experience uh, and exposure to the courtroom because they can't mature as officers until they've had some trial experience. Did you want me to continue with the uh, other question or do you want to do them one at a time? Uh, we'll do them one at a time and we're gonna alternate. Thank you. Uh, Matt, what are the biggest issues facing the DA's office? Thank you. Um, so from the perspective of uh, my perspective, the lack of resources that are um, dedicated to the um, judicial system are the biggest issue facing the, the district attorney's office. We have a lack of judicial marshals, judges, clerks, defense attorneys, prosecutors, and law enforcement officers. Uh, but we're only one part of the system. Uh, as part of the executive branch, we have to depend on the judicial branch and the legislative branches to do their jobs too. The judicial branch needs to get more judges, marshals, and clerks and staff the courts properly. Uh, and they also need to hire some logistics personnel to help them manage the caseload. Uh, we've had many instances where the courthouses in Washington County are just simply shut down on days because they don't have enough judicial marshals or clerks to, to open them. Uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, and the legislative branch needs to properly fund the courts, uh, the prosecution and the defense. Uh, there's only one defense attorney working in Washington County right now taking court appointments. That the system can't operate without the proper resources. Uh, <clears throat> the entire system really needs to be overhauled. Uh, and that's really the court's um, main area where it needs to work. 
Uh, the system is dependent on plea bargaining to work, but the default that the court has implemented is everybody gets a jury trial. And that just, it just doesn't work. Uh, we recently had a case blitz uh, that the court called it in Washington County, where the court sent the chief justice of the Superior Court and the chief judge of the district court to try to resolve the backlog of cases in Washington County. Uh, as of September 9th, there were 489 cases on the backlog in Washington County. The court called 225 cases at a two-day docket call. And as a result of that docket call, they set 17 cases for jury selection and called a jury pool in for two days. Uh, after allowing half of the defense attorneys to continue their cases or just not show up, and after several defendants claimed to have COVID or failed to appear at all, uh, and all was said and done, the court scheduled four cases for bench trials for my office. An arson case, a misdemeanor theft case, a clamming case, and a scallop dragging case. That's it. <clears throat> we are ready to try cases. We are prepared. We have our cases in order and ready to go. We just can't get the court time to do it. The court did accomplish something by having the docket call though. It, uh, it accomplished having approximately 60 cases resolved by plea due to the threat of a trial uh, for which the state was fully prepared. That was one positive that resulted from that. Uh, my office will continue to be prepared to present our cases whenever we're called to do so. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question touches on issues that both of you just mentioned. Uh, what will you do as DA to help clear the extensive backlog in the district court? Matt? Yes. Um, under my administration, District 7 has the lowest backlog of cases in the state of Maine of any district. We have 1,557 cases as of September 9th. Uh, the court published those, those uh, figures. Um, We'll continue to analyze our cases thoroughly and work through them as the interest of justice requires. Uh, but other parts of the state are going to get the resources uh, assigned to them. For instance, in District 1 in York, there are almost 6,000 cases backlogged. Cumberland has over 5,200. Andrew Scoggin has over 4,700. And Penobscot has almost 3,500. Uh, <clears throat> I've given my prosecutors discretion to resolve cases in the and the way that best serves the interests of justice while balancing the difficult issues that have been caused by the pandemic and the underfunding of the system. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the court closures due to staffing and docket calls only two or three times a year only compound the problem. We're never going to get caught up if that approach uh, is what the court continues to do. Uh, and I'm also not willing to simply dismiss cases in order to help put a band-aid on a broken system. Uh, the legislature has enacted these laws, these criminal laws, for a reason, and it's this office's duty to attempt to enforce them. Uh, we can't, uh, Mr. Granger um, mentioned earlier that, uh, about overcharging. Uh, when we have crimes that are authorized by the legislature and our, my prosecutors look at those um, facts of those cases, we need to charge all the crimes that are supported by the evidence, not just the ones that we pick and choose because those crimes have been set by the legislature. Uh, at some point during the process, we have to negotiate. And if we only charge the lowest crime possible, we have no place from there to negotiate. So the process involves negotiation. The court requires us to negotiate and offer, make plea offers. So in order to do that, we need to use all the resources that we have available. And if the case involves dropping to a misdemeanor, then that's what it involves. But at least we had the option to prosecute the case as the legislature uh, enacted the laws for us to do. That's all I have, thank you. Bob, what will you do as DA to help clear the extensive backlog in the district court? Well, there was a Defense attorney Machias recently uh, analyzed the situation and his estimate places it at 15 years to clear the backlog if nothing is done. Um, and that uh, is if during that 15 years, no new cases are taken in and prosecuted. Representative uh, Evangelos of the House Judiciary Committee sent a memo out to prosecutors a couple months ago, strongly urging prosecutors to call out nonviolent cases so the courts could start functioning again. Uh, with an estimate of 200 jury trials uh, per year statewide, if all the courts are functioning, um, there's about 22,000 cases pending. You can do the math. 
how long that's going to take. What we need to do is an extensive review of all pending cases. We need to triage what we have and prioritize cases. And unfortunately, consider letting go some of the victimless and nonviolent matters through a yard sale uh, cleansing. Um, we need to institute new policies on charging decisions and drop the shotgun approach uh, to charging. You don't need to throw the book every conceivable charge at a defendant. If you focus on the major crimes that were committed and forget about the uh, silly misdemeanors adding those on, uh, you can get a lot more done in a shorter period of time. You reduce the grand jury time uh, uh, to charging defendants and you reduce prosecutors time. Uh, we need to redirect the DDAs to violent felonies and serious cases, sex assaults, drug trafficking, burglaries, aggravated assaults, and clear this docket. Initially, there might be need to be more oversight of what the, what the assistant prosecutors are charging until they get uh, uh, in line with the new procedures that I would institute. Um, again, charge one or two major crimes, focus on those and forget the little stuff because we've got 1,400 cases behind us that we need to deal with. Um, and that's about the nut, nuts and bolts of it. Next question. Broadly speaking, what cases should be tried and when should the DA's office consider a plea deal, dismissal, or alternative sentencing? Uh, Bob? Well, at the outset, uh, I agree with Matt on one thing. Uh, we need to keep in mind that plea deals are essential to keeping the system moving. Um, however, there are, are big limits on how far you should go with that. Uh, defendants willing to accept responsibility for the conduct should get consideration, in my mind, in terms of length of sentence as opposed to reduction of charges that we've seen over the last eight years. Uh, prosecutors really need to take a harder line approach to violent felonies, drug trafficking. Um, harsher sentences are needed uh, to send a message. Uh, if we look at Washington County, um, they are now the uh, murder capital of Maine. Um, Crime has increased significantly, particularly in down East Maine. Um, I'm inclined to seek split sentences that reduce actual jail time serve for those who accept responsibility for their conduct and make reparations to their victims. There's lots of pressure from the jails uh, not to sentence people to lengthy terms because they're at capacity now. Uh, I agree with Matt also that the system is largely broken. Um, but I differ from Matt in that just adding more judges isn't going to solve the problem. It's the same pool of defense attorneys in the location. Um, if that doesn't change, we're not going to be able to have additional trials. You can have five judges up there, but it's still uh, limited to about eight to 10 defense attorneys in this area um, working. Uh, for first time offenders of minor and petty offenses, I think we can explore alternative resolutions that don't involve criminal convictions. Um, such as restitution, monetary reparations to victims, uh, a meeting with the uh, Down East Restorative Justice uh, representative uh, in a couple of weeks to talk about those issues, uh, make more use of the drug court system for possession charges, not trafficking charges. And we just need to focus on uh, getting rid of some of the more silly cases and focus on more serious stuff. Thank you. Matt, broadly speaking, what cases should be tried and when should the DA's office consider a plea deal, dismissal, or alternative sentencing? Thank you. Um, it, it's really impossible to speak broadly about appropriate case dispositions. Uh, no two cases are the same, and each case needs an individual attention to ensure the correct outcome is obtained. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the rules of unified criminal procedure require that the state extend a plea offer at dispositional conferences in an attempt to resolve the case. Uh, and a case can only be tried at the defendant's request. The defendant is in the driver's seat about who gets to have a trial. The prosecution has absolutely no say in whether or not the case gets tried. If the defendant does not accept the state's plea offer, they can enter an open plea or they can request a trial by jury or trial by judge. Uh, in answering whether a case should be dismissed, um, I, I guess a case should be dismissed when there's ins insufficient evidence to support the charges. Uh, for example, if there's no witness, no evidence, an unfavorable, an unfavorable ruling on a motion to suppress, or when the interests of justice require uh, for a case that's de minimis, for instance. 
Um, many times we approve cases submitted to our office for a prisoner arraignment. We only have a very short report called a probable cause affidavit. We have to make a decision with limited facts and then reevaluate that decision at a later date when we have the full investigation. Uh, and that's one of the big reasons for charging and then reducing charges because we have we don't have all the facts at the time of the charging. We have probable cause, but at a later date, we might find that we don't have a case that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt for the charge that was laid. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, and, and to address a couple of the other things, we already use restorative justice. Uh, we work with that program and um, I think it's a valuable program. And um, as I noted earlier, I was appointed as the only DA representative to the steering committee for the um, what was formerly known as the Adult Drug Treatment Court. Um, and I have always supported that program. We have a lot of really good results from the program. Um, unfortunately, in this area, we don't have a lot of the physical resources like courtroom area or other meeting area to be able to have the type of diversion programs that they have in Penobscot County where they have uh, you know theft diversion programs where people go and have a class for a few hours um, at their arraignment date because they have another courtroom that they can go into. We just don't have those types of resources here. Uh, we have a very small budget to run this office. We have very few staff and uh, you know we make the very best of what we have uh, in an effort to provide a good service within the budgetary constraints that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll move into um, questions submitted by the public. First one is, would you adopt a victim-centered approach and pursue maximum sentencing for violent crimes and sexual offenses? Matt? Yes, thank you. Um, so we already do that. The biggest problem, and I don't think that the public really understands this, is that the district attorney's office, with all the perceived power that we have, the only power that we really have is whether or not to charge someone. That's the only you know, uncontrolled power that we have. In sentencing, the only thing that we are really able to do is make suggestions. We can suggest to the court that something might be an appropriate sentence, but it is ultimately the judge's decision as to what the person gets sentenced to. Even with a plea agreement, the judge can refuse to comply with the, with the plea agreement or accept it and tell the, the uh, parties that they, the judge thinks that, well, I think they should get more, or I think they should get less. And then we have to go back to square one and start over. So to say that um, it's the district attorney's office who uh, you know, sets these, these uh, sentences is, is somewhat inaccurate because all we can do is make that suggestion to the court. It's the judge who makes the final decision about what the sentence is. And for a long time in my earlier career, it was, I did, I, you, know, you wouldn't have a client who would come in and say, uh, hey, let's just go um, make an open plea, which means go in front of the judge and say, hey, I'm guilty, give me a sentence, whatever you think is right. Because the judges at that time would be much more harsh than the offers that were being received from the prosecution. That's not the case anymore. Now that we, we make an offer and the, the judges are likely to give a lesser sentence. And it's very frustrating uh, for the prosecution, for law enforcement, and for all the parties involved, except for the defendants. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, would you adopt a victim-centered approach and pursue maximum sentencing for, vi for violent and or sexual offenses? Again, I, I think all charging decisions are uh, victim-centered uh, from the standpoint that we're pursuing charges on behalf of victims in the state. Um, not all cases, frankly, uh, are, are, should be pursued at the maximum uh, possible sentence. There's so many uh, aggravating and mitigating circumstances associated with each case. Uh, you can be rest assured, my inclination would be in serious violent crimes where there's a, a harm to a victim that I would be seeking very significant sentences. Um, if the judges aren't inclined to uh, impose those sentences, that's beyond uh, my authority, but at least I can pursue them. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. How can the justice system better handle offenders with mental health issues? Bob, do you wanna take that one first? That's a, 
a loaded question. Um, it, it's going to be real difficult for the justice system to step in and help uh, those individuals who are suffering mental health problems. Uh, they've Many of those individuals have wound up in the criminal justice system uh, as a result of those mental health problems and the lack of resources outside of the justice system uh, to adequately address those. Um, and the uh, justice system itself is actually somewhat constrained in what it can do. Um, the uh, uh, agencies that uh, provide assistance to those uh, individuals need far more funding. Um, you can make referrals uh, to those agencies, but if they don't have the funding, uh, there's no place for them to go. Um, so it's, it's not just a justice system question. Um, it's a societal problem. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, same question. How can the justice system better handle offenders with mental health issues? So that, that's a, a very difficult question to answer because the justice system isn't set up to do that. Uh, it's asked every day to do that. There are probably the majority of offenders have some type of mental health uh, issue that they're dealing with and struggling with on a daily basis. Uh, we've had um, juveniles um, housed at the emergency room at the Ellsworth Hospital for months because there's no place to put them when they have mental health issues, but they're committing crimes and causing real damage to the community. So they have to go somewhere. So they wind up sitting at the Ellsworth Hospital emergency room for a month or two. And that, that's just, that's not right. We need to have the legislature fund appropriate services uh, so that people can get the kind of treatment that they need. And so that we have another tool in our basket to be able to send us people to say, instead of going to jail, go to counseling, go to this inpatient treatment center, go, go to a service where you can get the help you need rather than having to sit in a jail cell, uh, which is really the only resource that we have. We have fines, we have jail, we have, uh, you know, we can do a deferred disposition and, and have community service or things like that. But we don't have a lot of resources to help with mental health uh, just because there aren't any. Um, we use alternative sentencing like deferred dispositions or filings and ask people to get counseling and, and seek services, but most of the time they can't afford it. Uh, and so it's just a, a vicious cycle that um, the judicial system isn't set up to, to, uh, to handle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in a similar vein, youth substance use is a significant problem in our country. Right now, there are teens and young adults being summoned multiple times on related charges without any real consequence. How can the DA's office better deter more serious future crime by, address, by, by addressing youthful substance use? Matt? So youthful substance use generally um, progresses to more serious crimes. The more someone becomes addicted and the more um, drugs that they need to use in order to get their same high, uh, it, it's expensive and it costs more. And so um, they're going to start committing thefts and burglaries and violent crimes uh, just as the natural progression of these things. Um, and I think this goes right back to the last question. We need the legislature to fund more services for these folks. Uh, we need, I mean, the drug court is a great program, but it is, it's really designed for adults, uh, for one thing, and it's designed for people who want to get help. A lot of times, um, younger folks aren't there yet. They're not at a point where they're willing to accept the kind of help um, that a drug court program or even the judicial system could, uh, could provide them. Um, and unfortunately, um, they don't realize they need that help until they've progressed down into, into the criminal justice system, uh, which isn't designed, like I said before, to, to give them the help they need. Um, it would be great to have the funding to be able to, to put into place um, uh, different alternative systems, uh, you know, something similar to even restorative justice. Um, to, to kind of help give these kids, uh, you know, a, a better path and to, uh, you know, to give them the supports that they probably don't have at home or in their community. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Bob, 
how can the DA's office better deter more serious future crime by addressing youthful substance use? Well, again, um, I think there needs to be a consideration of first time offenders uh, coming into the system, um, make contracts with those individuals to, uh, you've got a choice. Uh, you can go use the money that you have been using to purchase drugs and go get help, use that funding. Um, and if you are willing to do that, second chances are great for everybody. When you have repeat offenders coming in, you actually at some point have to act and uh, uh, exercise uh, the criminal law. Uh, drug court is great for individuals who um, are charged with possessory type crimes. I don't think that the drug court is useful for drug traffickers who are in this uh, business for profit as opposed to because of habit. Many of the traffickers don't use drugs themselves. They're just pushing it onto the population uh, at great risk to the population. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this person would like to know, since being an attorney, have you ever been investigated by the Maine Attorney General's office for a possible criminal offense? Bob? Not that I'm aware of. I represent all the investigators there. Uh, I think I would have heard about it. Matt, since being an attorney, have you ever been investigated by the Maine Attorney General's office? No. Thank you. That was, that was easy. Uh, all right, next question. Would you assign sexual assault, child, slash child sexual abuse cases to a consistent prosecutor? Matt. I already do that. Yes, my deputy district attorney handles the sexual assault cases, uh, both adult and, and child related, uh, it, meaning the defendant is either adult or a minor. Um, and in some cases when they, the, uh, the, the uh, alleged offender is a minor, um, I, I do have my juvenile prosecutor handle uh, those cases as well. Thank you. Bob, would you assign sexual assaults as child sexual abuse cases to a consistent prosecutor? Well, again, it's a huge territory. I don't think you can always assign it to the same prosecutor in two counties. Uh, quite frankly, I'd like to do those cases myself. Um, uh, I probably can't handle all of them, but I would uh, go at them vigorously. And uh, uh, I, I wanna be a hands-on district attorney. Our current district attorney does not try cases. So that's the big difference. Next question. Would you take the time to meet with victims and survivors? Bob? I absolutely have to meet with victims and survivors to prepare cases for trial. Uh, they deserve it. They've come forward. They've shown courage. And the DA should be giving them significant uh, attention in prepping cases. Uh, you can't very well prepare uh, victims and witnesses uh, to proceed in a trial, to, to uh, give them expectations of what they should be expecting uh, in a trial, the types of questions they might face without meeting with them. So absolutely. Matt, would you take the time to meet with victims and survivors? Absolutely. I, I do that on a regular basis. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just last week, I met with a, uh, a couple of parents whose uh, son was tragically killed in a, in a uh, automobile incident. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the most valuable uh, parts of my job is meeting with the, with the victims of, of violent and tragic crimes uh, because um, they have a perspective that is often overlooked in the, in the criminal justice system. And uh, having that perspective is, is so valuable to the, uh, to the prosecution of our cases. Thank you. Would you participate in community meetings like sexual assault response team, SART, uh, Matt? Yes, I'm a member of the SART team. Uh, Bob, same question. Oh, absolutely. Anything we can do to uh, increase the services for victims, um, anything we can add uh, or assist that group with, uh, I'd be all for it. Is Maine's indigent defense system adequate? Bob? Uh, 
in its current state, absolutely not. I think there's been 46 attorneys who have dropped out of that system. Uh, the current the very limited pool of attorneys who are doing it now, um, that, that system is largely broken. Uh, I think the state needs to look at a federal or a, 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 a state defender program um, because what they have in place now is falling apart. <clears throat> Thank you. Matt, same question. Is Maine's indigent defense system adequate? No, it's not. Uh, in my opinion, we need a public defender's office uh, that would be supplemented through um, private defense attorneys taking conflict cases and whatnot. Um, the, uh, the lack of services to the people of Washington County in particular is staggering. Uh, there needs to be a system that is similar to the district attorney's offices um, implemented around the state so that uh, defendants have proper legal representation uh, and it may sound funny to, to hear a prosecutor say that, but um, if defendants aren't represented adequately, um, the, the system isn't working. Uh, it's the prosecutor's job to see the justice is done, uh, not necessarily to, to uh, win cases. Is justice might mean that the defendant, um, you know, isn't convicted, but the reason that we need a public defender's office is so that those those cases get put through the system in a fair way. Uh, and a, a prosecutor even needs to be watching out to make sure that the defendant's defense attorney isn't messing up. Because if that happens, we wind up right back at square one after a post-conviction review. So um, it makes a lot of sense and it makes our jobs a lot easier to have an effective defense bar uh, and uh, have that available to defendants. Thank you. Does it make sense for Hancock and Washington counties to share a DA map? Um, I, I think it does. It is certainly difficult in terms of the distances involved, but in terms of the, the caseload, um, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense for Washington County to, um, to have its own district attorney. I, I mean, I, if the state legislature wants to um, have 16 different district attorneys, I mean, that, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference to me. Um, however, I don't think that um, we are incapable of doing the job under the current system. Uh, the, uh, my office handles between 3,000 and 3,500 cases a year, uh, about 30% uh, of those come from Washington County. So the caseload isn't um, uh, unbearable in Washington County. Uh, I know that the, the folks there would like to have uh, someone present to, uh, to you know, walk across, the sheriff says he wants to walk across the street and talk to the DA. Um, but the fact is, we have phones, we have Zoom, we have many ways to communicate. I'm always available. Uh, there's, there's never a time that he can't reach somebody. Uh, my deputy district attorney, uh, Mr. Toflon, uh, his main office is in Machias, and uh, he's right there to answer questions on a daily basis when he's not in Ellsworth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob, does it make sense for Hancock and Washington counties to share a DA? Well, I, I don't think so, but I, I think that uh, Washington County, which spearheaded the drive to separate itself out um, uh, for its own DA, that movement resulted uh, largely from the feeling that uh, Washington County had not gotten appropriate attention by the district attorney's office. And so they wanted their own DA uh, who would take up residence in Machias and Callis. Um, I think it works fine um, if the prosecutor will actually spend time there, uh, have uh, office hours to actually meet with humans. Um, I think it works. I would ask the people of Washington County to, um, before they go, go off and try to get a, a separate DA to give me a chance and let, them, uh, let me show them uh, the interest I would give Washington County. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
is there a question that you wished were asked here tonight that wasn't, Bob? Probably a hundred questions that should be asked. I don't know where to start with that one. Um, are there any other questions that have been generated by by uh, viewers that that should be answered? We kind of went to this one because we we burned through our our generated our submitted questions. Okay, um, I think um, people should be asking. They shouldn't be uh, making decisions about who should be district attorney based on uh, political affiliation as much as they should be asking questions about the experience levels of the candidates. Um, I think there should be a lot of questions uh, directed to the current district attorney. Um, it's his practice not to try cases. He hasn't tried cases for eight years. Uh, he has very little, if any, jury trial experience. I'm not sure how you can uh, properly mentor new assistant prosecutors if you don't have a trial experience? How can you mentor them in trial strategy, trial tactics, uh, jury selection, those types of things? So I think the audience may not be aware uh, of the experience levels that we're talking about, and they should be asking questions in that direction. Thanks. Thanks. Matt, is there a question that you wish to ask here tonight? No, thank you. Thanks. All right, well, I don't see any further questions, so we'll move into closing statements. Um, Matt, you're up first. Thank you. I, I just want to um, note that the people of Hancock and Washington counties have a choice. Uh, they can vote to reelect me and my team to continue to serve them competently and justly, uh, or they can vote to send District 7 back to where it was before my administration in trouble. Uh, the choice is clear. I'd appreciate your support and your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, your closing statement. I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity to serve as your district attorney. I enjoy doing trials. Uh, I've got law enforcement in my blood. I've had great success in the courtrooms. I've only lost three jury trials in the last 30 years. Um, I need to put that experience to work in the DA's office, which is currently near the bottom of the barrel in terms of successful prosecutions after trial. Uh, I started my career in the Hancock County District Attorney's Office and I like to bring that experience back to where we can uh, uh, work to make improvements to the trial record that is desperately needed. Uh, again, a DA without trial experience can't possibly uh, mentor new assistant prosecutors uh, appropriately. Um, I'll bring both essential uh, experience and common sense. I'll also bring established and trusting relationships with law enforcement with whom I've worked for the last 30 years. Um, I hope to restore faith in the office uh, amongst police officers, victims of crime and sexual assault advocates who have all experienced significant frustration over the last eight years. I think the biggest endorsement I could ever possibly receive as an attorney is to be selected by nearly every law enforcement group in the state to serve as critical incident response attorney, uh, where I represent officers involved in officer use of deadly force encounters. Uh, those are the most uh, serious situations law enforcement officers find themselves in. They could have chosen any number of qualified attorneys in the state, and they selected me. Uh, that couldn't be more flattering. Um, now they're again endorsing me to be district attorney. Those are the folks in the front line. They work with the district attorney. Why aren't they endorsing Matt Foster? Thanks. Um, well, thank you both for participating and answering the questions so candidly. And I urge anybody who has further questions to, to reach out to the candidates directly. Um, back to you, Ann. Thank you, Cindy, for moderating so capably tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you both the candidates for participating. I think our listeners learned a lot about you both and um, we'll go to the polls better informed. So we really appreciate your running for office, your willingness to serve. Public service is a high honor. And um, we thank you for your willingness to do it. Um, I think that's all for now. We're going to take a little break. We'll be back at, uh, eight, at seven o'clock with our second form of the evening, which is Senate District 6, um, parts of Hancock and Washington County. Thank you both and Cindy so much. Um, Good night. Thank you again. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Cindy.